Well, good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences and the IU Department of Astronomy, I would like to thank you for joining us this evening. We are delighted to reconnect you with your academic home and with each other. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's Director of Alumni Relations. At this time, I am delighted to introduce tonight's Master of Ceremonies, Professor Phyllis Luger. Professor Luger joined the IU Astronomy faculty in 1984. She received her PhD in astronomy from Harvard in 1982. Her research focuses on the dynamics of globular clusters and the role of X-ray binary stars in these systems. This research is carried out using the Hubble tel Space Telescope and the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Please join me in welcoming Professor Phyllis Luger. Thank you. Thank you for everyone joining us this evening. We hope that this event will enable you to reconnect with other students, professors, and friends, and help us all to build a stronger sense of community in IU astronomy. The spark for this evening's event came from the online reunion last May of the Princeton Department of Astrophysical Sciences, which became the model for our IU event this evening. COVID, of course, affected all of our professional lives, changing the ways we've been communicating with students and colleagues. As a result, applications such as Zoom now seem a more natural way to bring us together for events such as this reunion. I'm delighted to see alumni spanning the years from the 1950s to the 2020s and in geographic locations, both near and far. We appreciate your dedication to the department and our educational mission. Later in our program this evening, we look forward to hearing from all of you about your memories of the IU Astronomy Department, your professional work, activities, or anything you'd like to share. We will enjoy hearing about the variety of career paths that our alumni have taken from their start in our program. I'd like to take this opportunity to especially thank Vanessa Klo, the college's Director of Alumni Relations and her team for their excellent organization of this evening's reunion. I'm very grateful to Katie Pilachowski for her thoughtful support and assistance. Thank you to the students and the faculty for their presentations this evening and to the faculty for leading the breakout sessions. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all of the current and former undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs for their many important contributions to the astronomy department in research, teaching, and outreach. I'd like to thank staff, as well as the many friends of IU Astronomy for their support of the department through the years. The contributions of everyone in attendance this evening are integral to all that we do as a department. Okay, so our first speaker tonight is Catherine Rohde. She's an associate professor who joined the IU Astronomy faculty in 2007. She received her PhD in astronomy from Yale in 2003. Her primary research area is the origin and evolution of galaxies and their stellar populations. This evening, she'll be providing us with an update on the WIN 3.5 meter telescope and the new instrument. Kathy? Thank you, Phyllis, and thank, thank you everyone for coming. It's really wonderful to see all of you. Um, I've been asked to give a quick update about the WIN 3.5 meter observatory, and that's pictured here, and many of you, of course, have seen it in person. So WIN saw first light in the mid-1990s, and it was the first observatory to be run by a consortium that included public and private university partners, as well as the National Observatory. Um, that partnership has evolved over the years. Um, and now we have three capital partners who jointly own the observatory. Um, IU is one of them, University of Wisconsin, and Noir Lab, which is the new name for the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. Uh, we also have operational partners who contract with us to have access to the telescope for a few years at a time. And those operational partners currently are Penn State, UC Irvine, and Purdue. And we routinely get inquiries from other uh, potential partners who are interested in getting access to the telescope because um, in part because of the great uh, new instrumentation that we have available. 
So um, the current instruments on WIN um, available for science are Hydra, which has had a recent up upgrade and provides uh, multi-object spectroscopy. Uh, the one degree imager, which provides high resolution imaging over a 40 arc minute by 48 arc minute field of view. Um, we have integral field units uh, to do multi fiber spectros spectroscopy in a fixed array. And we have a near infrared camera. And our newest instrument is the NUID um, exoplanet hunting spectrometer, which is one of the world's most precise radial velocity instruments with a precision of tens of centimeters per second. Um, so in this picture, I'm showing part of NUID here on the side of the telescope. Um, to orient you, the light comes in, hits the primary mirror, goes back up to the secondary mirror, and then down to the tertiary mirror and over to this NUID port adapter. And then it goes down through fiber optic cables to a room in the basement where the spectrometer lives in a vacuum chamber. So NUID was funded by NASA and had its first observation in November 2019. Um, we have uh, lots of uh, things going on at WIND, some large scale surveys like John Salzer's Star Formation Across the Cosmic Time Survey, and then lots of new studies of exoplanets and their host stars with NUIT. So it's been a really exciting past few years for WIND, and our observatory continues to play an important role in the field, even with big missions like James Webb and the Rubin Observatory um, coming online. Thanks. Okay, Kathy, thank you so much for that really great talk about when. Um, so at this point, do we have any questions? Could you please remind me what what the um, uh, aperture uh, size of the primary is? It's three and a half meters. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the telescope is basically a gleam in the eye of the faculty when, when I was there. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's funny because um, I knew it when it was a gleam in the eye. <laughs> um, and now here I am all these years later, so still using it, yep. It, it is very gratifying to, to, to have seen it come to pass. Yeah, yeah. And Mike? So I'll just mention that from my home here in uh, Oracle, Arizona, I can actually see sun glints off of the wind so 65 miles away, wow. I can see it. So high wind. <laughs> Kathy Yale was originally one of the participants too, wasn't it? Yes, it was. They, uh, I was going to look that up today. They left in sort of the mid 2010s. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So you have, it's a new collection, new consortium, basically. It's a new consortium, but we kept the name because everybody knew when. So wow. yeah. It's yeah. a clever acronym anyway, so. Yes. What what was it like during the pandemic? I mean, did business go on as usual out there? Or did they you actually have shut down supply the chain. They, sorry, they um they shut the the mountain down for a little while, and then they started observing again, but only with very limited staff. And so um, most of us have not been out to Kit Peak. I think they're starting to allow some observers back to Kit Peak, but um, for all of us, we've been doing remote observing from the department for the most part with Win. Um, for the last two years or two and a half years, yeah. But you didn't have any trouble doing the remote observing from. I mean, from it's not as good, and I and I really like yeah. to take my grad students out and train them on the telescope in person. It, I'm gonna, hoping to do that in the fall, but um, but it yeah, it certainly works well. You know, and people have been able to continue to get data. So, yeah. And it looks like Zachary has a question. Um, just kind of, just kind of wondering what 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 are what are any upcoming plan, plans um, with with when and any 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 ideas for future instruments or or you know ch changes in organization or whatnot? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, I think there are many of us who would like to upgrade the CCDs that are available on the one degree imager. Um, but we did just you know 2019 is when knew it had first light, so there's a lot of effort going toward really making that as effective as it can be. Um, so I think that'll be sort of the, the focus for a little while. Um, our next speaker is Sang Hu Wang, who's an assistant professor who joined the IU astronomy faculty in 2020. He received his PhD in astronomy from Nanjing University in 2016. His research centers on the study of exoplanets using advanced observations, including NUID on the WIND 3.5 meter, and carrying out dynamical simulations. He will be speaking about his exoplanet research. Sanghu? 
thanks for coming, everyone. It's like, it's like, it's amazing. There are so many people here. So I'm Song Huang. I'm an assistant professor and joined IU astronomy two years ago. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and share with you guys my research. My research focuses on understanding planet formation by characterizing exoplanets, so the planets orbiting stars other than our sun. So as we know for very long time that our understanding of planet system and planet formation is was only based on the eight planets in our solar system. Myself love Pluto, but it's not a planet anymore. So about 30, like 30 years ago, the first exoplanet get discovered. And since then, thousands of them has been found, including several that I found. What's fascinating about this field is uh, all those exoplanets we found looks very different from the planet in our solar system. Some of them are hot Jupiters, the Jupiter-sized planets are very close to their host stars. We don't have a hot Jupiters in our solar system. And some of them are super Earths, which are slightly larger than Earth and smaller than Neptune. We don't have those kind of planets in our solar system either. So what's going on with them? How do they form? And more broadly, is our solar system unique or are we alone? So this is probably the first time in the human history that we are able to answer all this question because of uh, instrumentation like NUI. Like what's cool about our pro program at IU is that we have, a, as Casey just mentioned, that we have a privileged access to NUI, which is uh, probably the best uh, RV instrument, radio velocity instrument on Earth. That my students and I use that instrument to measure the fundamental properties of the exoplanets and compare them to our solar system. And eventually we want to fit our solar system into the big picture. And because of this uh, privileged access, our students, both undergraduate and graduate students, can make their own contribution to the field and get their own credits by answering all these fundamental questions. That's what I want to share. Thank you. Any questions? On your, I'm sorry. On your second line down, is that mm -hmm. implying is that implying that the uh, the smaller planet is at a different uh, orbital inclination to the the larger? Yes, that's uh, something we are working on, and probably so there there are some mutual inclination between small planets and big planets in the same system. That's something we are working on. And yeah. we found one of system is like that. That's uh, something we never seen before. Idea why that would occur? Because certainly the, the solar system's model is that everything is nearly in the same plane as far as we know. Yeah, I think, I think they probably formed in the same plane, but uh, the post disk, dynamics excites the inclination for those small planets. That's a, that's a good question. So kind of like the way that the planets of the solar system are thought to have migrated around in the course of their, uh, the evolution of the solar system, maybe in some solar systems, they actually can assume different orbital inclinations? Yes, yes, that's a definitely true. Like another, I can, sorry, I, I should close this. I can share with you again. Like one thing that we are sure is how Jupiter's like in our solar system, all the planets orbiting in the same direction compared to the sun's rotation, like all the planets sit on the same plan and aligned with sun's equator, but that's definitely not the case for exoplanets. Exoplanets can be misaligned. Like the, if the star rotating this way, the planet can be on the same plan, but can be on the polar orbit, even the retrograde orbit. So what's the reason for that? There are a lot of explanations. So that's, a, that's something we are working on actively, uh, try to see what's, uh, what's the real cause for, for those uh, dynamics. The systems with these nearby hot Jupiters, I mean, the, the, is, is the misalignment um, the, the norm in, in these cases? 
yes, like 50% of contributors show some kind of misalignment. It's, it's weird. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a uh, part of a, a main part of research I'm working on with new age. So to, to try to understand why those hot Jupiter's are misaligned. If our solar system alignment is just a coincidence. Is there any way to tell if these systems also have highly elliptical uh, orbits? I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, the kind of billiards game that's thought to have occurred. In the for hot, yes, uh, for hot Jupiter's, most of them are circular because of tidal effects. Probably okay. at first they pro they probably not uh, circular, but right they are circular right now. But many exoplanets are missed, uh, on eccentric orbit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think maybe we should move on. And our next speaker is Constantine Delianas. He's an associate professor who joined the IU astronomy faculty in 1997. He received his PhD in physics from Yale in 1990. He studies the abundance of lithium and other light elements in open clusters and globular clusters. Khan is our Director of Undergraduate Studies and will be giving us an update on astronomy, undergraduate education at IU. Khan? Thank you, Phyllis. I have been DUS almost my entire time at IU uh, since a little bit before 2000, so I know many of you and it's so great to see you again. And it's also great to meet those of you that I don't know. I'd like to thank Halden Cohn, with whom I shared the US duties in the early years and from whom I learned a lot. Well, we're always trying to find ways to improve our program, and it has really helped that the number of astronomy majors has been increasing dramatically. Nationwide, the number of astronomy degrees has doubled since 2005 and tripled since 2000, and we have seen corresponding increases here at IU. These increasing numbers bring both opportunities and challenges. One opportunity is that we can offer more courses more often. In the early 2000s, we increased the credits of A201-202 from three to four credits each, thereby providing room for more activities and labs. But the real big change came in the advanced courses. When I arrived at IU, the only 400 level course we offered was A451, then called Introductory Astrophysics. We added A452, taught by Lisha Van Zee and then Kathy Rohde, changed A451 to Stellar Astrophysics, taught by Halden Cohn, then me, then Katie Pilachowski. For a while, we added A450, Galactic Astrophysics, taught by Eileen Friel, and more recently added A405, Computational astrophysics taught by Samir Salim. A305, observational techniques taught in recent years by Katie Pilchowski and or John Salzer has evolved. Long ago, students would gather data at Kirkwood and Getty Link observatories, then for well over a decade on our specially built rooftop telescopes, and lately at the wind point nine meter at Kitt Peak. In recent years, we have been able to consistently offer at least one advanced course every semester. It is my hope that we can continue to expand our advanced course offerings in the future. In 2013, we added a BA degree to provide more opportunities for our students. This BA has fewer math and physics requirements than the BS and makes it easier to combine with other degrees, such as computing, math, or journalism, among others, depending on student needs and interests. We take great pride in closely mentoring students one-on-one -on -one in research, taking them to telescopes to learn how to observe in situ, and encouraging them to present results at conferences where they can also meet cohort and astronomers from all around the country and even the world. During the past decade, one third of our students have earned departmental honors, which is well above the college's goal of 10%. So well done, guys. Well, we're always looking for new ideas, so please feel free to make suggestions. Yes, I was uh, wondering about uh, your ability to place uh, graduates into uh, relevant positions. Well, um, I would say they're 
excellent. Uh, our graduates do a big variety of things as I'm actually hoping to learn from all of you uh, some more about. Uh, a big fraction, I think it's nearly half go to some kind of um, graduate or professional school. Uh, a bit over a third historically have been going to graduate PhD programs in astronomy or astrophysics. Uh, and then a lot of our graduates go into a variety of uh, industries. Uh, some become teachers. Um, some uh, work with um, outreach programs, um, all kinds of different things. I'm one of those that uh, uh, took advantage of other opportunities. I was at Illinois for a year and then uh, decided I wanted to be employed and went into the nuclear power and uh, nuclear safety field. Uh, now, if you were asking about the fraction of students who, who get jobs, it's, it's really everyone these days. Uh, something like a decade ago, the Wall Street Journal did a study um, where they must have asked thousands of, of graduates over years, um, you know, how many got employed, what kind of salaries did they get? And um, out of 170, I believe it was different majors, astronomy majors were right at the very top. Um, there was 0.0% unemployment. Now we were tied with something like four or five other majors. So, uh, and, and they didn't tell us who was the number one, but certainly we were among the top five of 170. And my experience with our graduates, at least the ones I know about, has been that uh, they, they all find jobs as long as they, they're interested. And, and, and as I said, in a big variety of fields. And did I see George? Did you have a question? Yes, is there still an asteroid program at IU? No, I, I don't think there is. <clears throat> uh, no, there is There is not. Uh, the plates were all archived at Lowell Observatory, approximately 7,000 of them. But that program ended around maybe the end of the 60s. Oh, <laughs> yes, it was one of my jobs. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> and me too. I worked on the program for four years. <laughs> I think we might have time for one more question, Irene. Uh, Andy, did you give us some numbers roughly how many graduate students you have and undergraduate students you have? How many people you teach each year? Oh, sure. Um, well, we have between 50 and 70 altogether undergraduates. I'll let uh, Enrico, the DGS, tell us about how many graduate students there are. And uh, we teach a bit under 2,000 students in general education courses. So I forget the exact number, but it's close to that. Uh, and we've had a historical high some years ago, of about 2,400 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, about how many students we teach depends on how many courses we offer. Uh, it, it seems when we offer more, we get more students. Thank you so much, Khan, for that really great summary of our undergraduate program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Greg Lukens, who received his bachelor's from IU this spring. He came to IU from Martin County High School in Stewart, Florida. I believe he's in Florida right now. He did his senior thesis at IU in exoplanet studies, working with Song Hu Wang. Greg is starting a PhD program in astronomy at Penn State in the fall, and Greg will be speaking about his experiences as an undergraduate astronomy major at IU. Greg? Thank you, Phyllis, for the intro, uh, and thank you, everybody, for having me speak about the, uh, or representing the undergraduates here. Um, I think it would be good to start just, um, I was going to talk about why I got into astronomy, but it's the usual cliche, the the space picture books and, and Star Wars as a kid. Um, but so when it came time to apply to college, I kind of already knew uh, I wanted to study astronomy. Uh, so when I actually got the offer from IU, uh, the main appeal was uh, the, the welcoming department, you know, a smaller department, but welcoming. And, and really what stood out to me was the ability to do research as a freshman and just anyone was able to do research if they really showed the motivation to do that. That's what I got from that. And um, so that was really important to me. Uh, so I actually started doing research with Lysa Van Z. I I think she's in here. Hi, Lysa. Um, uh, we, uh, I started working on extragalactic radio astronomy research with her, um, and she showed me the ropes of a lot of things uh, with research and coding, which I had never done, but I'd heard stories of <laughs> as a high schooler. Uh, and 
And then, of course, I was taking general astronomy one and two as a freshman. And then A305, I got to use the Kirkwood Observatory with John Salzer. That was very fun. Uh, and then, of course, COVID hit, as everyone knows. Uh, you know, everyone's world got turned upside down a little bit. Um, but I, I want to say, like, specifically that out of all the classes I took online at IU, I think the best ones for my astronomy classes, I lost the least from those in terms of going from in-person to online. And uh, I feel like we, as a department, handled it really well. Um, I think we looked out for each other as a close-knit department. So um, I wanted to mention that specifically. And then, of course, uh, you know, junior year, started taking the upper-level classes, foreign-level classes. I took Stellar Astrophysics with Katie, uh, Extra Galactic with Kathy, um, and then even dabbled in some graduate classes. Um, and uh, I got to say, and I even uh, moved, I forgot to mention, uh, I started working with Sanghu Wong, um, doing some exoplanet research. Um, and I learned a lot from both Sanghu and Lysha over the course of my time there and, uh, and from everyone. Uh, and I got to say that over the four years, I feel really prepared um, for graduate school coming in the fall. And I got uh, all of my friends as well that I know in the astronomy department, uh, even those not going into graduate school, just going into a career, they also feel the same way. They feel very prepared for what they're about to do uh, because of their uh, uh, partnership in the, the astronomy department. So um, thank you uh, for having me talk about it. And if there's any questions, let me know. <laughs> Thanks so much, Greg. We really appreciate all those very kind words about the department. Well, we wish Greg, you know, our very best wishes as he starts his PhD program at Penn State in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, Enrico Vesperini is an associate professor who joined the IU astronomy faculty in 2012. He received his PhD in physics from Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, Italy in 1994. His primary research area is in theoretical and computational stellar dynamics, with a focus on different aspects of the formation and dynamical evolution of globular star clusters and globular cluster systems. Enrico is our Director of Graduate Studies, and he'll be giving us an update on astronomy graduate education at IU. Enrico? Thank you very much, Phyllis, and it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to all of you and I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this event. So our graduate program currently is composed of 22 graduate students and four graduated, not including four who graduated in the last few months and four more will graduate by the end of the summer. So it's a great, great year for graduations. Four new students will join the department in August. I'm talking about new students in the last few years, we have seen a significant increase in the number of applications to our graduate program. The average number of applications in the last four years has been 50%, has seen a 50% increase compared to the previous five years. So a lot of applications and a lot of high quality applications. So our students, as many of you already might already know, especially recent, more recent students take a number of core astronomy courses, including observation astronomy, exoplanets and orbital dynamics, interstellar medium and galaxies, dynamics, stellar interior and stellar atmospheres. And these courses, uh, in addition to these courses, we have a graduate seminar uh, courses, which in addition to a variety of science topics have been recently expanded to include topics that the department thought would be beneficial for the future career of students. So graduate seminars now include, have included in the last few years courses on scientific writing, professional development, astrostatistics and astroinformatics. In terms of research, the general topics are probably known to most of you that our students work on, and it's stellar astrophysics, exoplanet, extragalactic astronomy, and stellar dynamics. Those are the general areas that our students work on. And the main facilities are the wind telescope, the 3.5 meter, the 0.9 meter. And in addition to these observation facilities, our students have a limited access to great uh, computation facilities that we have here at IU, including uh, various supercomputers, and which have been 
expanded recently to include Big Red 200, which is one of the fastest university owned supercomputers in the US. Some students have also been successful as PI in accessing external telescopes like BLA, the ESO, BLT, and the Hubble Space Telescope. Those students lead a number of weekly, uh, take, have taken a leading uh, role in organizing a number of weekly activities like the stellar and galactic and extra galactic group meetings and the organization of the Friday lunch, Friday lunch seminar and which during the pandemic has been moved to a virtual format. But if anything, they have taken that opportunity to even improve the seminar series and expand that seminar series to include presentation from students from grad other graduate students from all over the US. Uh, our graduate students are also uh, involved and leading a number of outreach activities, including weekly Kirkwood Observatory open houses and the activity of the annual Indiana University Science Fest. In terms of time to another important aspect that I'd like to mention is that we have made a pro uh, some progress, significant progress in, uh, the, in reducing the time to degree. So in, for students who graduated after 2015, the average time to degree has been around 5.9 years down from 6.7 years in the previous uh, the previous periods between 1980s and 2014. And so we have succeeded to reduce this time to be without uh, sacrificing the quality or the, the decreasing the quality of the research done or the research productivity. And our students have been very competitive on the job market. About 75% of the students who graduated after 2015 we are hired either in postdoctoral positions or teaching faculty position after, immediately after graduation. So they have moved either after their first postdoctoral position or immediately after graduation into a variety of other uh, professions, including computer scientists and national labs or academic IT centers. And they have made use of their astronomy and technical training. I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to mention about our graduate program. So I think that's all. So if there is any question, I will be happy to answer. How many female students do you have in graduate schools these days? At my time, there were three of us. I think we, on average, we have been about, four, right now with all the graduation, I haven't done the recent calculation, but around 40% of our students are female students. And they, it changes Good. from, uh, year to year, depending on who is graduating uh, and who, the new students. So that's, but, yeah. and typically we, I think we have succeeded to reach a good balance, a gender balance. Good. I think we it's have quite a difference two. from the past. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we have one or two when I was a graduate student. There, so. Yep. No, right now it's, uh, again, it old. oscillates between 30, 40% or, One question I, I, it comes to mind about right then, uh, of the various things that are taught, obviously all kinds of things with physics and astronomy and such. But one thing I found in later years that I, I don't think I ever really heard about was as a, as a researcher, and by the way, I went off into industry. I, I didn't uh, continue on astronomy and astrophysics, but um, as a researcher working in, in academia, uh, do you provide, have you ever attempted to provide any kind of guidance, mentoring, or training, and how one applies for grants and various kinds of support, because that seems to be kind of the magic sauce. And in other words, if you have good ideas, that's great. Okay, you got to have good ideas. And if you have the ability to conduct research, that's great. You got to have that ability. But if you can't harvest you know, external funds, then if you're working for any kind of an academic institution, they start looking at you funny. Like, what do you mean you don't have any external grant money? What's wrong with you? Um, so I wonder, these, these seem like skills that should be teachable. Um, and I'm, I, I believe the people that I worked with, the faculty members that I worked with, certainly did that. I mean, in many cases, they had external uh, grant money. In fact, I was, uh, 
I benefited from the fact I was actually a research associate, research assistant for a couple of years uh, by virtue of the fact that there was money to be had like that. But unless you've had experience writing a, a grant application or something like that, or if you participated in the writing of a grant application, do we try to involve students in that, uh, in that process? Well, that's it's a bit up to individuals to advise sort of students, but in terms of department, mm -hmm. what we, as I was mentioning, what we have recently introduced is a graduate seminar course on professional development, which has been recently taught by Katie Rowley and previously by Eileen Friel, which includes a number of a discussion of a number, and Katie can, of course, she has taught the class, can uh, be more specific, a number of skills and discussion of number of aspects which are critical for job applications and a <laughs> number of variety. Uh, our students recently, and Sam, who is going to speak after me, has been successful, for example, in uh, as a PI, you know, along with John, who is first supervisor in applying for an HST proposal, which I guess it's observing time plus a grant. So we try to either at the department level with this kind of courses or individual individual level uh, supervisor students to uh, convey the importance of these different aspects. Absolutely. I think it's interesting that you, you've, you're speaking to kind of meta skills. You know, these are not things that that you have to do to perform a research project, but the things that you need to do to survive as a researcher. Yes, and absolutely. By the way, this is not unlike the situation with, uh, you know, some years ago when I was an undergraduate, they dawned on uh, the college I went to that, uh, gee, we should be teaching uh, undergraduate uh, physics, astronomy, engineering students, uh, some things about liberal arts and writing and, you know, things of this nature. You know, what do you mean? What do you mean engineers can't write? What's this? Um, and so we, we got to the point that when I was an undergrad, we had uh, had part of the required courses being language and, and the culture and, and history and things of this nature. And I went to a real engineering engineering college. I was uh, Rose Polly, uh, Rose Holman now. And so, you know, it, it kind of, it, it felt like it was kind of a cultural shift going on or something at the time. But likewise, from a graduate student perspective, it's important to make sure that the students are, you know, have this set of meta skills as well. Uh, otherwise, you know, you, it might not survive. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we really, James, we appreciate all those good points. I think we're going to need to move on. Yeah. Um, so we'd like to next introduce one of our very successful uh, recent PhD recipients, Samantha Brunker. Uh, she completed her PhD at IU in galaxy evolution, working with John Salzer. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from the University of Kansas. And she's going to be starting a postdoctoral position in the area of star formation, working with Kara Battersby at the University of Connecticut in June. I think she's just about to move there. Um, and also, I wanted to thank Samantha for the lovely drawing of Kirkwood Observatory that was used for the reunion invitation, which you've all seen. And Samantha is going to be telling us about her experiences as a PhD student at IU. Samantha. Thank you, Phyllis. Um... So like you said, I just graduated recently in April and I worked with John Salzer at IU and I studied specifically extreme star forming galaxies called green P galaxies. Um, and I focused on kind of a comprehensive study of them uh, where I looked at their uh, kind of general galaxy properties, their environments and their chemical compositions to try and understand why they were going through such an extreme phase of star formation. Um, as a graduate student, I worked as both a teaching assistant and a research assistant, and I think I gained a lot of skills from both of those. Um, specifically, you know, since I want to stay in academia, I gained a lot of skills and learning how to teach a class and, and work with students. And then also on the research side, I had a lot of great opportunities to use the WIND telescope. So I observed all the data for my thesis myself on the three and a half meter telescope using the HYDRA instrument. and um, I got to, I guess, put forth proposals as a PI for that as well. And then um, I had a great opportunity to apply for Hubble time and received it with my advisor, John, and a few other collaborators. Um, and then um, I've also worked on the, um, for the Center of uh, Excellence for Women in Technology on the Graduate Women in Technology Board too, where I got to meet people 
uh, from other departments outside of astronomy. And it really gave me a great appreciation for the support that I received in the astronomy department from uh, the faculty and then the other graduate students and then also my advisor, John. Um, so I'm really grateful that I chose to go to IU. I think the environment is just wonderful. And I think I really appreciated the camaraderie amongst the graduate students. It really is like a tight knit family and community where we all support each other and you know help each other through uh, grad school, which can be quite difficult at times, especially with the pandemic recently. And so it was really nice to be in such a supportive department where everyone truly cares about you. Um, and then like Phyllis said, I'm just about to move to Connecticut uh, to start my postdoctoral position with Kara Battersby. And I'm really excited. Um, I'll be working on a slightly different project, um, studying kind of intense regions of star formation at the center of the Milky Way, but I'm hoping to tie in a lot of the skills I used here uh, at IU and then continue also my research on the green piece. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much, Samantha, for all those very kind and complimentary remarks about our department. We really appreciate it. Do people have questions for Samantha? Um, I, I'm actually curious. You, know, you mentioned the experience that you got teaching a class there. Was was it was there formalized training in how you taught the class or were you just put into the class? I asked that because um, that was one of the things that I found very important for me when I moved into my first tenure track position was the experience that I had there teaching. But that being said, I also found myself having to figure out a lot of things on my own. And this was, you know, decades ago. But I'm just wondering if there is more formalized training that either the department or the college or the university as a whole provides. Um, there, there is some training that you get. Uh, I wouldn't say it's like, you know, like you take a class and how to teach a class. They do offer a lot of programs at IU. And we, I think we were required, uh, if you work as a teaching assistant, you're required to do some a certain number of kind of events or activities regarding um, teaching and you know learning different skills for teaching classes or, or even working as a teaching assistant. Um, and so I gained a lot from those. And then uh, I also worked with Leisha Van Zee for a semester on developing an online course. So I learned a lot from that. And so I got to sit in on all of their meetings on how to develop tools for the online courses and developing individual lessons. Um, so that, that was more kind of like, you know, I was lucky to have that opportunity, which I gained a lot from. And then also, um, as graduate students at IU, we have the opportunity to teach us a, a course, a summer course, if you want to, um, or if you, you know, need the support over the summer. Um, and so I took advantage of that and was able to teach uh, an online course during the summer, in which I learned a lot about, you know, how to interact with your students and, you know, the best way to try and get your students to interact with you, I think is maybe more difficult, but um, definitely, you know, there are a lot of opportunities. And I think that's something that IU does really well is giving you those opportunities as a graduate student that you can then take forward. And um, I'm gonna be using them as a postdoc to uh, teaching a course as well. So I oh. think I really appreciate uh, all of those <laughs> lessons and, and things that I was able to learn at IU that I might not have experienced at another, in another graduate program. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Samantha, and we wish you all the best in your new postdoc at, at UConn. That's just great. Thank you. Okay. Um, our last official speaker is Katie Pilachowski. Uh, she's a distinguished professor and Daniel Kirkwood chair. She's also the department chair. Uh, she joined the IU astronomy faculty in 2001. She received her PhD in astronomy from the University of Hawaii in 1975. She conducts research on the evolution of stars and the chemical history of the Milky Way galaxy from studies of the chemical composition of stars and star clusters. Katie is going to be providing us an update on IU astronomy, including the plans for the total solar eclipse on April 8, 2024 in Bloomington. Katie. Thank you so much, Phyllis. It's really wonderful to see everyone. Um, I've only been here, as Phyllis mentioned, about 20 years, but I know so many of you from my other connections in astronomy. And it's just wonderful to see so many old friends on, uh, on Zoom today. So thank you all for being here. Um, there are just a few highlights I wanted to mention about the department in the last few years. Uh, one of them is the renovation of Swain West. And I'm not sure everyone knows this, but over the last few years, a university invested something like $36 million in renovating and updating Swain West. And our building now is gorgeous. 
um, I think it was the first renovation since it was built in the late 1930s. And it's just been beautiful. They created some lovely new spaces for students to interact. It's really just a beautiful building now. So I wanna make sure you all know you are welcome to stop in and see this building as, as in its current instantiation. It's just really lovely to be in a fresh new building. So uh, come by and, and say hi. Uh, second thing I wanted to mention is our departmental commitment to diversity. We've worked really hard over the last few years to try to increase diversity in our programs, both gender diversity and um, underrepresented minority diversity. We currently have a very active program working with the Department of Physics. Um, I figure if physics majors, if physics could increase its diversity in majors, we can steal them and they can join the astronomy department. We're such an attractive department to students. So I wanna help physics get more students in and then I think that will benefit us as well. So we're working very closely with uh, physics departments and setting up programs and collaborating with various diversity programs on campus to try to increase the number of undergraduate majors in particular that come into physics and eventually we hope into astronomy as well. Um, I want to invite everyone, I wish it were true today, but it's not quite, but invite everyone to check out our new website, which I think we'll have open on the 1st of July or thereabouts. Um, our, our current website has gotten a little um, out of date. I, like, information is good, but the, the design is not. <laughs> so our new one I think is gonna be really exciting. And I hope after July 1st, we can send a note around to everybody to say, we're open, come take a look at our new website. I'm really excited about all the things we've been able to add to that. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the eclipse. So we are within a few miles of the center of the path of totality for the 19, or 2024 eclipse. Phyllis mentioned April 8th. It's gonna be a big day here on campus. Uh, what we learned from the 2017 eclipse from the cities along the path was that populations in towns tended to triple during totality. And so we're working very closely with the campus. That's far beyond our ability to handle, but we're working really closely with the campus to figure out how we can handle traffic, what kinds of programs we can provide, what kind of training we can work with the community to provide to schools and families uh, before the eclipse, how we handle these kinds of crowds and, and make sure that everybody has a, a wonderful time. Um, I wanted to specifically invite all of you alumni to come and help us because I think we're gonna need dozens and dozens and dozens of volunteers, particularly on Eclipse Day. So if you're interested, please let us know and we'll uh, very much appreciate, appreciate your help. Um, we're working closely with the uh, Monroe County Schools, for example, and they have already um, decided not to hold class on April 8th, 2024. They've decided they don't want to have students on campus. They don't want the liability for watching the eclipse. So they've just canceled class already on April 8th in 2024. So it's clear the community real realizes uh, what, what's coming and is starting to prepare. I did wanna give you a warning. The campus hotel, many of you may have stayed in the Biddle Hotel in the past. They have set their rates for reservations six night, or excuse me, four night minimum, $600 a night. So if you, if you wanna get a reservation to stay, pick a community that's not quite Bloomington, but a further, further out of the path of totality, and maybe you can find a good rate, but we'd love to see you during Eclipse Day. So I'll stop there and ask if there are any questions. Katie, I wanted to interrupt and mention that Roberta Humphreys sent you a message in the chat asking, are most of astronomy's undergrads double majors with physics? Many of them are. Khan can speak more directly to this, but a significant fraction are double majors. They get double degrees, a BS in physics and a BS in astronomy or, and astrophysics. Yeah, there are so I many courses together. <laughs> Go ahead, Kai. I can't add the uh, specifics because I just don't remember uh, how many it is, but it is a significant fraction. I wouldn't say most, I'd say maybe a bit less than half, but it's, it's quite a significant fraction. And many, some at least some of the others have double degrees with the math department as well, and some triple degrees uh, with all three departments. Katie, I saw you mentioned something about their modeling of Swain West. <clears throat> I know there was the, the back part, the astronomy part that was newer, maybe 19, 50s era, 60s 1958. Era. Mm -hmm. And then there was the front part and even more Swain East, which had kind of a Hogwarts feel to it. You know, uh, I remember going into the library at Swain West and you go down to the library and the further back you went, 
it was more like a process of spelunking or something. You go back, you, you dig your way into the stacks, and I can recall the smell of moldy uh, journals and such, you know. Yes, so things have changed. Our library is gone. Oh. Uh, many of the books are now in the auxiliary library facility where we can call them back at any time, but they're not actually on shelves. Oh. And a lot of another, the active part of our collection is now in the chemistry building. Uh, we still have our, our own special librarian who's responsible for the astronomy, um, physics, um, oh. computer science and math collections. And we work closely with Bob Noel in the library. Uh, those of you who recall the campus from 1972 probably remember the new addition that was built at that time, uh, about half of which is now gone. It was decided that that new addition was too close to Third Street, and so they just chopped it off and rebuilt that entire wing of the building. So it's quite different now. Well, this is the part that was on the face of uh, Swain West. Yes. We, we were in vacation there several years ago, and I saw that part, and I thought, you know, I think they added that on or something. So that's they the did. Part it's gone. So the 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 uh, concrete block section on the back is still there. That's your current area, right? Our our part is almost the same. Uh, we yeah. have uh, new windows and you know new light fixtures and fresh painting and flooring and all of that. Okay. Um, okay. So you'd find us very familiar, but the rest of the building is very different than it used to be. <laughs> yeah, interesting. It was uh, it was a different era, from a different era. Madeline, you have a question. Yes, I do, um, because uh, I've been thinking a lot about the uh, 2024 solar eclipse in the past year, and in my uh, rabbit holes of research that I've done on it, I've discovered that April does not tend to have the best weather, and I was um, considering that I uh, am helping uh, Ball State with some things for the eclipse, it makes me wonder uh, what you guys are thinking about doing for about that unfortunate fact. Like, do you guys have any plans in case it does happen to be cloudy? We all have to have backup plans in case of clouds. Um, so, you know, people, as we found in, the, in 2017, people, many people don't like to drive too far from home. Plus it's expensive to uh, find hotel rooms in totality if you're going to Texas. Uh, so we think there'll still be quite a few people coming to Bloomington, even if there's only a 40% chance of clear weather. So the campus is planning to have a big celebration uh, and including, uh, they wanna get a celebrity host in the stadium and we'll live stream what we can uh, if we can't, if it's cloudy here. Uh, and they're planning to have lots of musical presentations and parties and big celebrations in addition to the eclipse itself. So at Kirkwood, we're hoping to live, assuming clear weather, hoping to live stream the entire eclipse from the solar telescope uh, out to the world. And so we're really hoping for clear weather for that. Uh, we're also working now to uh, improve uh, Kirkwood. We, the physical plant has been over there for the last few weeks, patching up the building, which is really good to see. Uh, Brian, you have a question. You mentioned Monroe County is closing. How about IU? No classes. They haven't made a decision yet. I hope they're going to stop classes that day. It would be cruel to have classes yeah. during the eclipse. <laughs> Otherwise, but, no one's um, going to show up. <laughs> yeah, nobody, nobody will be in class. That right. will be my advocacy to the campus is just cancel classes that day. Yeah, OK. And John, you wanted to say something. Well, I was just going to answer. Um, Try to answer Madeline's question. Um, you know, one of the plans in, in the works, Madeline, is to have all the faculty members at IU uh, give um, lectures that morning. And that all the hot air that would be generated by those lectures <laughs> would build a high pressure system over the campus and it would clear off the clouds and we'd be able to see the eclipse. That's an excellent idea. <laughs> Good thinking, John. <laughs> 